evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 9th, 2022, and this is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee, consistent with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. I will not read the part right now about public comments since we're going into executive session um, for a couple matters and we will return at approximately seven o'clock. Um, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Sure. Second. Okay, um, I will clarify that we are going into executive session for the following purposes. Um, one is to discuss collective bargaining with nurses pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A. Um, and item B is to discuss litigation strategy pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30, Section 3. Um, and we have added this to the agenda um, under the 48-hour open meeting notice, and we are allowed to because um, we received notice of this particular matter within the 48 hours and some issues related to it need to be addressed immediately. So um, this falls under allowable reasons um, under open meeting law. Okay, uh, roll call vote, Maria, please. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Jefferson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. yes. Mr. Minion. Yes. yes. Ms. Prince. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Prince. Yes. And Mayor Berger. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if anybody is on, we will return. Um, in approximately half an hour. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the school committee going back into open session. We apologize for the delay. We have business to take care of and um, uh, took longer than we anticipated. Um, I will repeat that we are um, meeting consistent with chapter 20 of the Acts 2021. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation the public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. You use either of these options during oral communications to be recognized to speak. Um, so thank you all for your patience again. Um, I ask that you all join me with a salute to the flag. Business is oral communications. If there are any, if there is anybody attending that would like to speak, please raise your hand now, um, and we will allow you to speak. Uh, public shall have the opportunity to speak at every regular school committee meeting heard under oral communications. Our oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request, length of any nature, relative to school committee business, to appear before the school committee. State their problem without debate, and the matter may be referred to the proper subcommittee. For items that are on the agenda, members of the public may address the committee with permission of the chair. Persons speaking under oral communication shall be limited to three minutes each and shall submit a copy of their prepared communication to the recording secretary. The school committee chair shall not allow complaints as to individual performance or character. Okay. Anybody like to speak? I'm looking for hands. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on to comments from the chairperson, of which I have none. Um, recognitions, does anybody have recognitions they'd like to? I do, I went to the uh, one of the showings this weekend of uh, Little Mermaid, and it was a great performance over there at the O'Malley. The kids and the staff and the crew all did a wonderful job with it, so just want to have that recognized. Awesome, absolutely. Hockey. And I look forward to it this coming weekend. Uh, and our hockey team is blazing through on the ice. If you ever see them skate, my gosh, they are talented and uh, uh, really fun to watch and cheer on. Um, and for the public who may not necessarily be able to get there, they are live streaming the games. Um, and I think they do a really good job of live streaming our games. Um, the announcers are really good. 
and uh, it's good to cheer on even from home. It's nice for the kids to know they have our community support. Uh, so next game Friday at five at, on um, at O'Malley Rink, Talbot Rink. And as Jenna Smith, who is not with us tonight, who's our student advisory council, one of our members would say, be there. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So, um, okay. Tickets are going fast and they will tickets, sell out. Yeah, tickets yeah. will definitely sell out. Um, okay. Um, so we do not have a member of this uh, Gloucester High School Student Advisory Council that I can tell. If anybody is here from that, that I do not recognize the name, please let me know. No. No? Okay. Um, next is the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Does anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? So we done. Um, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Maria, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Reason. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. And Mayor Berger. Yes. Uh, motion passes um, six to zero. And uh, Sam Watson is not with us tonight. Um, so she is the only member that is missing this evening. Okay. Deliberations on educational issues and superintendent's report. Madam Chair, is it okay if we take this out of order? We Absolutely. have some guests here. Um, most notably the YMCA folks. Is it okay if they go first? Sure. All right, uh, if, without objection, we'll take the YMCA report first. So we are um, the YMCA is a tremendous partner, long-standing partner with Boston Public Schools. They uh, support our students and our families in, in a variety of ways, and we'll hear about those tonight. So tonight we have Brandon McAvoy, their school age director. Heather Boudreaux, their camp director, and Gerald McKillop, who's our chief operations officer. Welcome folks, we're glad to have you here. And as always, thank you for your partnership. And please help us uh, inform the committee and the public just how things are going this year. Well, and thank what, you. Know also what, some of what you have planned too. Thank you, thank you everybody for the opportunity tonight. Um, do we have the ability to share a quick presentation? Yes, who would you like to share, uh, Brandon? Do you want to share or, or one of your colleagues? I can I can drive it. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, he has. And yeah, you, he you, has. Should have, you should have the ability to do so. And the bottom where it says share screen. Yep. So can everybody see that? Yes. Again, thank you everybody. We will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, my name is Gerald McKillop. I have the opportunity to serve as the Chief Operations Officer for the YMCA of the North Shore. Um, I am a born and raised Gloucester uh, boy. Um, and, um, you know, for me, one of my proudest achievements in my professional career has been the opportunity to bring a world-class YMCA to Gloucester. Um, what I wanted to see was a YMCA that could do what it's done for the communities of Beverly and Marblehead. And we're certainly do, doing that. Um, I'm joined tonight by two of our emerging leaders from the Cape Ann Y, Brendan McAvoy, who oversees our school age department, and Heather Boudreaux, who oversees our camping services, but is also one of our inclusion specialists. I'm going to go quick because they are going to be the stars of the show tonight, uh, but quickly just wanted to cover a couple of things. So when we talk about that impact, um, when we closed our Middle Street YMCA, we had just over 3,300 members. When I ran the report this morning, we have just over 9,000 members in our YMCA community. And for us, that really provides the opportunity to foster a community within our Y and have a place for families and children and uh, teens and tweens to connect. Um, for me, I have been so proud of the effort of our local Y team in Cape Ann. Um, if you wanna see the resource that that's become, we'd be glad to show you if you haven't seen it yet. But the work that's happening there, the participation in our enrichment programs that you see listed in the presentation, we've become a true destination for teens and tweens in that community. And what this will ultimately allow us to do is what we've done in, in Beverly and Marblehead. And for us, a key thing for teens is to be able to be a choice employer for teens in the community and having the relationships that we're able to build with them now, I believe will translate to that. And for me as the COO of the Y, the most important thing that we do is say yes. We say yes to every single person, regardless of their ability to pay. And that's in everything we do, membership, program, school-age care, early education, summer camp. 
This year, we're planning to invest over $600,000 in financial assistance. That's the best investment that our organization can make. It's the investment in our community. And majority of that support does heavily skew towards child care and camp. And so um, you can see what we provided last year. We're, we're projecting an uptick. Um, and we would continue to ex we would expect to continue to see that number to grow over the next couple of years as participation and program goes. But tonight, um, again, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to superintendent. Thank you to the school committee for your belief in our why and our organization. Um, I was glad to hear the superintendent reference the partnership. Um, and that's what we believe too. Uh, this is an amazing partnership. We are serving kids year round. Um, and we're doing so extremely well, in my opinion. Um, and I can kind of quantify that a bit. So we use a tool called Listen360 um, in our industry. And I think many industries, a net promoter score is a key indicator of the experience that you're providing. And for us, we know that the benchmark on a national level of 70 is what organizations strive for. And I wanted to point out tonight and really thank the two folks who joined me Brendan and Heather, to talk about what they've done. You can see the NPS scores for summer camp and for our school age care. And I hope you guys on the school committee and the superintendent that you are proud of those scores as I am. This is when a parent fills out a survey, lets us know how we're doing, they give us a numerical score, and there's an algorithm that will ultimately give us a net promoter. There are YMCAs around the country that can't break 50 or 60 in your local YMCA and the people you're gonna hear from in just a few seconds are doing industry leading work when it comes to satisfaction and engagement. And so that's something that we're extremely proud of and we're extremely proud of Brendan and Heather. And so with that, if there's, uh, we can save questions to the end, I am going to turn it over to Brendan to give us a bit of an overview of what's happening in our school age program. And thank you again for your time, we appreciate it. Thank you, Gerald, for that introduction. Um, I'm very excited to speak to the school committee tonight about our partnership with the, uh, with the Gloucester Public Schools and the Runner After School programs within, within your schools. Um, the first part that we would like to speak about is supporting the whole child. Um, we, we provide seasoned staff that really provide care for 192 children across six programs. Five of those programs are within the city of Gloucester. The last program is in our is in Rockford, which is a neighboring town. Um, so we do offer a program with out, outside of Gloucester, but most of our programs are within Gloucester. Um, a lot of our staff do transfer over to our camp program in the summertime, which is key to providing an engaging and safe childcare program for the children because they feel that they really feel close to the staff that we work with, and to see those staff transfer over from after school. To camp is very exciting for the children. Their first day when they come in, they know that they know the staff ready and they feel comfortable with those staff. We also offer inclusion specialists and technicians now. Um, we provide the children the, who provide children with support and the care that they need to grow themselves into successful individuals and to really learn the social emotional skills that they might have missed out on the last year or so, year and a half, two years with uh, COVID. Um, we are. We are very excited uh, to share some information about our tutoring program that we rolled out in November. Uh, we have a former staff member of the Gloucester Public Schools, uh, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, you might know her as Heather Hughes. She um, really took on the load of uh, becoming our tutoring expert. She provides tutoring to each program once a week, um, either within small groups or individual care uh, during those times. She helps the children with their reading. Uh, we have many testimonials that provide information from the parents on how successful these children have become after working with Mrs. Hughes for just a few a few months now. Um, we also provide our routine our routine updates with uh, the families and the and about their children and the success they're having um, with their schoolwork. Also, with our second step program, as as we know, the Glasgow Public Schools follows the second step program within the school. They also offer a program that's for out of school time that we started to follow this year. Um, so we kind of in line with this with the school now. It provides the staff and the children with self awareness, uh, responsive decision making, and building peer relationships that results in gaining a lot of self confidence uh, and enhancing collaborations and making better decisions as they grow as individuals.
So we're expanding our impact here, which is one of my one of the most exciting parts about what I do. Um, in the beginning of the year, we had um, we were only able to have about 26 children in our emergency care programs when the schools closed. I know in October we had three, two or three days where the schools were closed through a, a pretty bad uh, windstorm that had hit the area, and a lot of parents were reaching out for care. At that time, we were only only we were only able to offer care for about 26 children. Uh, during those programs, which upset me a little bit. And looking into it with EEC, we were actually able to expand our license at our WAS, at our Gloucester YMCA to 65 children now during emergency care programs. So we can offer that care to parents that have to go to work those days. Um, and we're able to provide engaging activities for the children all day long from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. during those days, unless the weather doesn't permit for us to open until about nine. Um, we are also looking to expand our licenses in all of our, in about three to four of our Gloucester programs. Um, so right now, we are providing a lot of care for the children, but we want to expand that to provide care for more families and bring in families that might be new to the area or coming in late to the school year so we can open up more spots in our programs and allow these children to have a fun, engaging area for them to go to after school and a safe area for them to enjoy when they are done with their school day. Thanks, Brendan, for that. Um, I'm Heather Boudreau. I am the camp director and the inclusion specialist for the Cape Ann YMCA. Uh, I get to talk about my favorite topic, which is camp. Um, so as Brendan had mentioned, we do do the social emotional programs at the school age level, and we carry that into camp. Uh, so we're gonna support their mental health. We have the same staff. Uh, and then we also have our second step curriculum that we will administer at camp as well through our inclusion technicians and our inclusion specialist. So this year, looking at our 2022 camp year, we're already 40% full, uh, which is really exciting. So we last year, we saw that number at the end of May, and we're already seeing it already in the beginning of March. Uh, so we're filling up really fast. Uh, people are looking for that that program, the enriching activities for the summer. Uh, we're implementing our STEAM activities uh, through our art and theme programs uh, and through theme weeks as well. Uh, we're ensuring that we're not turning anyone away. Uh, we're, we're serving 164 families last year with an average weighted support of 50% in financial aid. So I hope that everybody can see and appreciate the great work that's happening um, as we continue to want to be that lead partner for the school district. Um, the, the growth that we've had in the past couple of years, um, really over the past year, um, and to be able to hold the quality level we have has been great. Um, we're excited to wrap up the school year on a strong note, and then we will quickly roll over to camp. Um, and again, thank you everybody for your time. Glad to answer any questions that folks may have. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Does anyone have questions? I, I just have one on, on the uh, tutoring services. What, what, what ages are those offered to? Uh, so we offer our tutoring services to uh, children. If they have homework in kindergarten, we offer to them, but we see a majority of them first uh, first grade through fifth grade that we offer the tutoring services to. And any child can uh, jump in those services at any time they, they feel as they need. Um, whenever Mrs. Hughes is at their programs, they can join that group and be part of that tutoring service. Yep. And when we, this one's directed to Heather, I think. Uh, when you talk about camp, you're talking strictly camp spindrift or does it kind of dovetail into activities at the actual YMCA or what does that look like? Yeah, so we're talking about camp spindrift out in West Gloucester. Yep. Now you do wonderful work up there and it's, it's really encouraging to see, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi Heather. It's Keith, I kind of know each other, but um, um, the uh, camp, Coming the season, is it a, a five days required for enrollment or are you doing the um, a la carte model again? Uh, we are doing a five day a week model. So uh, to sign up for camp, you have to commit to the five days. Um, that just ensures that we have the quality of program. Not all our programs run every day, so we can actually offer more that way. Mm -hmm. So you know, more time for all those activities. Uh -huh. okay. 
something out. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I know how important um, your program is to our parents and families uh, and to the students. It's um, obvious you care deeply about the community as well as um, each individual kid. So thank you for being here and thank you for your patience. No worries. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next um, item of business is the O'Malley Learning Benchmarks. And with us, we have Principal Lindy and Maura Donahue, our curriculum coordinator at the middle school as well. Thanks for having us here. Um, ben, are you going to share? Oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can okay. Thank you. Um, it's very nice to be here tonight. We have some good information to talk about um, and uh, some exciting things and some information that also uh, will show us the work that we still need to have before us. Wait. Just a second. These are some students out front uh, working on linear equations, just so you know, using our dots will come in handy still. It's a good um, use. They're measuring angles out there. <laughs> Uh, so I apologize to the few of you who are at the budget meetings, but this first couple of slides are repetitive from that, but I thought it was important to do this intro um, regarding what we're working on overall. So these are some of the strengths that we consider to be part of our fabric. Um, one of them is the, the literacy focus that we have identified as critical to all of our kids' uh, progress and growth and learning. Um, Second is social emotional support, which as we all know with the pandemic has increased enormously the need for. Um, and in, um, under that umbrella, we've um, added adjustment counselor this year and also put into place a social emotional learning support center that's being staffed right now internally with all of our counselors taking a share and work an hour at a time. And um, so we keep that center available for kids all day long. They don't necessarily have to wait until their own counselor is free, they can come to the office and say, you know, I need to see somebody and, and the person on duty is paged to come so they have someone to work with. They've got skills identified, a plan identified. Um, students are identified as uh, being able to access that center. It's not open to just anyone, but students who are struggling are able to go in there. Um, for STEM, we, uh, we have our STEM center is up and running. We've got all three labs, 3D print lab, bio lab, and um, the chem lab all up and running this year again, thanks to construction over the summer. So that's um, something that we're really proud of and really well known for is, is having that center in place. Uh, restorative practices, our PACE program is also helping contribute to learning. We've kept kids in school when they had infractions or when they've had conduct incidents that a timeout during the school day. So rather than sending kids out of the community when they made a somewhat egregious error and need some timeout, we can keep them learning and keep them in school as opposed to being home. Our band is back um, performing. We've got some adjunct instructors that have been added and they're joining Carlos uh, Menezes to help bring our program back to the robust place where it was and we're all really excited on about that um, and as Bill mentioned we have the uh, O'Malley musical back in play and today the fifth graders for the first time in a few years were able to come up and visit it was amazing just having all those little faces in the building and the, the level of excitement because we haven't been able to do these things so it was very nice to have them there uh, and finally focus on growth um, we have our, our leadership teams we have a teacher leadership committee that's um, sort of a grade level based representation and our instructional leadership team that's, that's focused on instruction that was um, put together from the sustainable improvement plan. Those are operating jointly. So our, our focus throughout all of those meetings, the next one's Tuesday, is about um, sustainable improvement and growth. Uh, the three focus areas that all of those things funnel into are improving student learning, which is gonna be our focus tonight student engagement and, and making sure that we're aware of and trying to build students' feeling of being part of the school, having a voice, having input into 
what they're learning. Um, and then finally, professional collaboration, which um, we've done, you know, we're focused on in all of our meeting structures. And we've, we've recently embarked um, working with the Collaborative for Education Services. Uh, they work in partnership with DESE and are funded by DESE. And they've been coming in and consulting to um, just take a look at how we're using our professional learning time and, and how we're able to work our teams. Um, we have a decent amount of time for collaboration in our schedule. We want to make sure that we're making the most out of it in terms of how we approach our goals and objectives and our processes for those. So tonight's focus is student learning. Um, and we've got some, some good data to show you. So then you can jump right into that. And if I think I'm correct, and school members can correct, can correct me if I'm not, is that this is the first time in a long time, maybe ever, but I think a long time is safe to say, that O'Malley has come to give a learning report on our on benchmarks during the school year. I think it's the first time. First time. Great. I mean, we've had MCAS reports, but we have not had. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah probably. I, I don't think I've done one. I, we've done reports on school improvement plan and where we're going with that, but yeah, no, never right. really does. So. And that All right. uh, the committee and and, um, and the members of the public will, will rec recognize, if, if you also tuned in last week, and the committee tuned in last week, you were here, um, the, the similarities with, in terms of the, the structure and, 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 the, and the assessments um, with our K-5, to which is uh, by design. Potential. All right, so just a few points of what we're focused on for literacy. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these in detail. So uh, curriculum review was first and foremost on our list, um, and we do have a curriculum review committee established focused on literacy this year. Um, it, we've implemented a literacy intervention class this year, which you will see has already shown some growth. Um, and uh, the ongoing analysis of the STAR 360. I know that elementary went through the STAR 360, but just as a recap um, for people who may be listening, it's an adaptive assessment that we give fall, winter, and spring at least. Sometimes it's used between for progress monitoring. Um, it's a reading and a math assessment, um, and it's, it's completely online. The benefit of STAR 360 for us is that it's completely standards aligned. So the data that we get from the assessment gives us very specific information about what our kids are learning um, in reference to the state standards and it's aligned to Massachusetts. So we are able to say, okay, we've got you know, this child who has skill deficits in certain areas or this group of children who have skill de deficits in certain areas and then we're able to fine tune our curriculum and our success plans with that information. Uh, it has drastically changed the tone and the objectives of our data teams that we've been running. So we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Um, when you have very concrete, explicit information, you can make very concrete, explicit decisions and take actions very differently as opposed to the prior assessments that we used where the conversations typically revolved more around how the kids were doing in terms of red, yellow, or green for performance, but then they got stuck on the questions and was it a good question or not a good question, analyzing what the question meant, et cetera. Now we're talking about the kids, their performance, the skills and content. So it's a, it's a really huge shift that's been really meaningful for us. Um, finally, we've, we've begun part of this professional development we've done this year, the part toward literacy has been with Keys to Literacy, which the high school has been using for at least a couple of years. And um, a, a lot of our staff got involved with that um, so that we can bring in, again, some research-based, evidence-based, high-quality instructional practices that we're implementing consistently. So our overall plan, three parts, we're, we're kind of doing the first two in tandem. So normally you start with tier one, it's curriculum review, alignment, looking at your materials and resources, making purchases, doing trainings um, and implementation. Um, so we've got that started, however, we had the ability to also start the tier two at this point. And given that opportunity, it didn't make sense to sacrifice the tier two to wait until the tier one was done. So we've got these, these two things going. So our, our response to intervention right now that we've tried is literacy intervention class, and that's in process and, and growing. Um, and then the third step will be to scale it. So when we talk about some of the things that we're starting to show progress with tonight with regard to literacy, the next thing to think about is, you know, which of our groups of kids aren't necessarily benefiting from this? How do we scale this so that all kids have high quality instruction, that all kids have the opportunity for targeted intervention, 
and then all kids have the opportunity for growth um, to maximize their potential. So the literacy curriculum process, the committee was convened, Laura facilitates it. So um, I'll just go through the points and then let her talk about the work they've been doing. Um, so it's comprised of, it's Maura, uh, the curriculum, uh, sorry, the program leader for ELA, Stephanie Kucher, um, and then several different teachers. Some members of the ELA department, special education department, social studies, or literacy intervention teacher, an EL teacher, and the library media specialist. So they're all on board. It's um, the focus is on the ELA standards and practices and what we are aligned with where we're not. Um, and then, um, but it's a it's a more of a global discussion because literacy doesn't stop in English class. So all of this is looking at the core in, in ELA first so that we can then spread it out to our practices and all of the other subjects. Um, our I ask how many are, people are on that committee? What's that? How many people are on the committee? 10. 10. Um, so the, the objectives are pretty straightforward. They're re reviewing alignment, curriculum resources, and instructional practices that are in place, um, looking at up updating the scope and sequence, and then planning and implementing pilot um, and adoption of whether it's practices or program or different curriculum tools. But the, the key to that is high quality effective practices that are research-based and have data behind them to show their effectiveness. I'll turn over to you to talk about how the process of the committee is running. Sure. Thank you for having us. I um so, turn off the sound. Turn off sound and your mic. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. I'm new here. I'm new approach. Um so we are meeting uh at least once a month, this team of teachers and looking at all of these different aspects that Lynn has talked about, our guiding question is, do our teachers have access to high quality standards aligned materials that are consistent throughout, um, throughout the school and throughout all of the classes so that we have an equitable approach to, to teaching and learning that all of our students can benefit from. Um, our work so far has been really looking at what do we have in place? What are the things that we have in place that are working? And also what are the things we have in place that we can identify with inconsistencies or challenges? And um, as we go through that process of identifying these things, it also steers us in the direction of what are our priorities and what do we need to um, look for and what are our non-negotiables in tools or materials that we might want to explore. So um, over the past several months, we've been doing that work. We're reaching the point where um, we're our last step in that um, learning and preparing process as it's defined by the state is really looking at what the data tells us. So you're getting a snapshot into um, what the team will be looking at on Monday. And then we'll move into the, okay, now we know um, where we are now, where are we gonna go and, and what tools are out there um, in Massachusetts and, and wherever we can get our hands on that is going to take us to, to where we wanna be. Sure, I have a question. So um, thank you for that explanation. Um, I have a granddaughter at O'Malley, so I get very interested in what's going on and what, what we can do to help that school. So when we, years ago, when we looked at the elementary school level um, and we got Bay State involved and things like that, it was pretty successful for our elementary schools to have those type of practices come in. And I see that happening now at O'Malley, which is wonderful. I guess my question is to you, um, hearing you tell us um, of the approach that's coming, is there an ability to find a middle school that's doing extremely well, which I would struggle probably to find because you know middle school is the worst age and most difficult to educate. But I'm wondering if there's any other school districts with best practices that we could reach out to too, because I know we did it with, I think we were when we were doing um, elementary um, because they had their successes. And I'm wondering if, if you've been able to identify or want to identify a middle school that we could maybe learn from instead of trying to reinvent the wheel? Sure, with regard to the curriculum review, we have um, we have partners with the Department of Ed that are helping us 
you know, go through this process. And as we start to identify, well, what do we want this to look like? There are um, communities throughout the state that are, are success stories in, in each of these different approaches that will they'll connect us with and enable us to visit, to see what's worked for them, what are the implementation pitfalls that we want to avoid, things like that. Um, Good to know. Yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, we, that's okay. <laughs> um, we, we have done some, we've done professional development during our time this year and on a variety of things. We've done a bunch of community work and some other things, but focused on literacy, about 50% of the faculty attended uh, two full days of workshops with keys to, uh, to literacy. Um, that was the English teachers, social studies teachers, and most of the special education teachers, while the other staff did some other things. Um, and the focus of, of that um, PD was on comprehension with vocabulary and um, vocabulary development, organizational structure of how you work with information that you've been provided to develop comprehension, and then deconstructing text. So using webs, graphic organizers, and that kind of thing to identify the information you've got before you. Um, in terms of a school right approach, we've done a couple of things in-house. So we've done some um, writing across the curriculum practice with specialist science, social studies, looking at what they currently do for writing writing in, in the their classes. Um, Dennis Hurley facilitated those sessions with the staff. Um, and then we also brought at the last PD, Maura did a training on, on two column notes. So from Keys to Literacy, the people who did that formal training got a variety of things in addition and including two column notes. And then more about the rest of the staff on board with two column notes. So what we're looking at now is having the staff share. It's, it's one specific strategy. It's, it's research based, it's effective, and it gives us a consistent place. Um, it could have been many other things that we started with, but the, the goal is to, to help all of us understand the necessity and the benefit from having a consistent practice. Not that everything needs to be lockstep in all things, but there are certain areas, particularly when we're struggling school-wide with something that we wanna have common language, common practice, and for, for kids to understand that that compartmentalization that happens when you hit middle school and you start going to math class or science class or social studies class, that all of these things have a consistency among them and what you learn in English class about language, comprehension, interpretation, analysis, translates into other places and vice versa. The thinking you do in science translates into math or, or English when you're analyzing language. So, so having something consistent that's done in the same way, um, regardless of what it is, has huge benefits in helping everybody understand that, that we learn holistically and that, that different kinds of learning is, is inter interdependent with others. Um, so our data teams, uh, the data teams have been meeting for several years before. So this is my fourth year and they were in place at least a year or two before I arrived here. Um, they meet fall, winter and spring. It's the, they meet uh, for a couple of hours at a time with three teachers in that grade level with a program leader. Um, so the three sixth grade math teachers and the math program leader will meet together. Um, at this point, what they're analyzing is, is in math, they're using the STAR data. Um, in ELA, they're using both the STAR data and the locally written uh, benchmark writing assessments that they've developed and used over years. Um, and so they're, they're again, looking at um, what they see in the data, which kids are doing very well, which kids are underperforming, um, what factors might have impacted their performance on a particular day, if we're talking about the STAR assessment. You know, if you're not feeling well that day, is, is your performance out of line with what the teacher has seen all year long? Um, there's one, at least one circumstance in which we had a student retake the assessment because it was so off um, what the expectation was for performance. The benefit of having a tool like that locally where we can go back in and, and go down deeper is, is um, really beneficial. Um, so the focus of the discussion, as I mentioned before, is on you know, how the performance is aligned with what's already been taught. So you know, is it because we haven't taught that yet or did we teach it and the kids didn't get it? And if that's the case, then what are we gonna do differently? Is it a matter of going back and 
creating lessons to reteach a large group of kids or the whole class? Or is it a situation where you want to target the instruction for a smaller group of kids? Um, so that's, that's what's coming out of those meetings. Lessons are being developed. Um, curriculum is being analyzed for, for the alignment and it's, it's all contributing to a, a greater focus on how we create growth and how we impact achievement when kids aren't getting it on the first round. Um, so now we're going to delve into data. Um, there, so there are a couple of different kinds of slides that I've provided for you. Um, at the beginning of English, the ELA, and the beginning of math, there is what I've been calling the rainbow slide um, because it does have the colors. And it's similar information to what you're going to find on the next series of slides. But I, the visual on this, I think, is really important because it shows you what we're looking for is for those red areas in particular, but also the yellow to be shrinking and the green and blue to be growing. So in each of these bands, you've got sixth grade from the fall, sixth grade from the winter. And you can see that the blue and green are taking up a much greater portion of that bar graph. Seventh grade, again, the blue and green, there's a little bit of growth. So we're going in the right direction, but also if you look at the red in the winter, um, it's dropped even a little more than the blue and green have grown. Um, and eighth grade as well. So we've got in all cases from fall to winter, students not meeting expectations is lower than it was in the fall. And in all the cases, the blue and green, which are the meeting and exceeding expectations are larger. So we'll look at those a little bit differently. Um, you may find it clearer in these versions. Um, so we have the not meeting and then partially meeting in the center, meeting and exceeding. This is the format that K-5 used. So I thought it would be helpful just in keeping the pattern the same. Um, so you see again, the large drop in not meeting and the sh there's always a shift in the partial meeting, whether it's going up or down. And the end game that we wanna look for is that increase We've got an 11% increase in meeting and exceeding from fall to winter in sixth grade ELA on the start. So this one adds another component. We were able, so this, this shows you the same cohort of kids. The blue is now less spring. So you're still looking at where they came in in the fall from last spring, the fall is the red, and then the yellow is the winter assessment. So again, moving across, we look at the yellows in the not meeting category, it's dropped down to 8%. We get over to the meeting exceeding and we're up at 53% from 42% in the fall. So, so lots of good growth in ELA on the star for sixth grade. Seventh grade is not quite as dramatic. Um, we still have a drop in not meeting and still a rise in meeting exceeding. And the longitudinal will show you the same thing where they came in. It's interesting to see where they were in the spring because one of the things you know we know we're in pandemic. This is only the second year we've taken the star assessment. What we don't know is what those spring assessments typically look like. We don't know how the pandemic impacted kids' ability to retain what they learned in a school year. Is this typical loss going from the, the, the blues here, especially the not meeting, is down, which is great. Um, but then we, you know, the, the, it's a little more stable going through. So what we, we don't want to see is, is the spring being the highest and staying the highest. We want kids to continue to grow. So um, you'll see in some of the others when we get to math, especially that it's a little flatter. Here's the eighth grade. Again, drop in, not meeting, rise in meeting, exceeding. And the longitudinal adds in the spring and um, you can see the comparison where spring was a little up and down and it still follows sort of the same shape as the um, as the, the fall and winter but again we've got growth there all right has a question yeah. so um i don't know how to frame this appropriately um it looks like in what we're seeing in this data that it's it's generally under 50 percent of our kids were meeting and exceeding mm -hmm. Um, why, why, why do you think that is? 
You know, it's it's hard to know. I think we started before the pandemic in that place. We were, you know, barely treading just under um, the, the, I mean, the state had 50 percentile mm -hmm. as set as the, the measure to meet. Um, so we were under that coming into the pandemic. Um, so the whys, I think, are a lot of the things we're talking about. Right. It's, you know, is the curriculum aligned? Do we have the right resources? Do we have consistent instructional practices that are high quality? So there's, the, you know, there are a lot of different um, things that impact what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think one of the things that we look at in these is, is just pushing. So we want to push those kids out of not meeting into partially meeting and then from partially into meeting and exceeding. We've got a lot of kids in the partial meeting that we're at mid-year at this point. My hope is that in the next three, four months when we're still doing instruction, that we're going to make that additional growth. The whole curriculum will have been covered, for example, which, you know, at mid-year when you do an assessment, you're never really sure. We didn't create the STAR assessment, so it's not based on necessarily what we taught. You know, is it is it an adequate measure of where kids, you know, are with our curriculum compared to another town, another state um, in the country? Because those are all national norms. And I'm assuming like the sustainable improvement plan and all the work you're doing with, it, with Desi is focused on Absolutely, this. I mean, yes. yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah, that's everything that we're doing is focused on this. Okay, that was a very basic question. Yeah, that's so okay. Just to add, all the one's getting at is, is the way you change this, okay? And you know, it's been a long time for Amelia, right? Um, is just the practice we're talking about. The practice we've been doing at the elementary school, right. you know, making sure the curriculum is strong, making sure folks are having training on that. And the, and the last piece you did, you've been talking about but didn't touch on is is the is the is the you know the student you know learning team process of looking at the data and knowing what parts of the core instruction are kids not getting and then and and, and that'll differ class of class grade to grade perhaps you know and then from that information doing the interventions we're talking about so well. again most much of this is new to O'Malley, you know and so um, but it, uh, they are the right practice they are, they are the practices to work on actually. And just, just following on that too, it's this has been it's been a long time that O'Malley's been in this place because we're going back now ten years that, longer longer than that. So you know, I'm thinking like when the innovation plan was first brought in, when I went back to the findings when we went into sustainable improvement, we had the same issues three wow. years ago when we went into sustainable improvement that we had when the innovation plan was brought wow. in to correct those. So that didn't work, right? Um, and we're in the same place. So it's it's unfortunately a pattern that's been in place for a long time, which makes it harder to turn around. Um, but I think, you know, it's I'm really happy to have more on board to help with this, and that we're we're able to really focus on systematic approaches to the curriculum design, the instructional practices, the data analysis, and the consistency, um, so that we can. We want to make sure that all kids are getting an equitable experience and a, and a, and a really positive opportunity to learn. Um, and that, that's really essential. Can you just quickly explain, without going into a lot of time in depth, what partially meeting means? Like, how do you get into that category? What does that mean? Does that mean like I'm floating at almost not not meeting? It could be a like, lot it of seems things. like a yeah. So within that, if we broke that down, yeah. there would be a, a huge span. Is it a number that triggers? It's a number, but it's I don't. It's not do you remember what the number is. For I start? think it's it's somewhere between. I looked at it today too. I think it's between twenty and forty percentile. Okay. So it's a range. So you may have yeah. some close some kids who are on the high end of that range, right. ready to you know dip in, ready in the meeting. So you may have folks who are just barely in the partial meeting, and that's another level of analysis that folks do, which is. Right. You know the kids who are on those cusps watching out for them right but it is as more just said it, it's a range and, and so within that the kids are spread across it um and, and then that doesn't like that nothing so i think what would be helpful for me in the future because we want to see progress and then I, I, we're making decisions in our budget to sure. give you that ability to make progress because that's such a large number i would like to see that broken down a little sure. bit in other words are we more almost getting to meeting or right. are we down there? You know, I, okay. I just think that level of information at some point yeah. would we be helpful that. because it is such a, a large part of the population and has Absolutely. been for such a long time. That makes sense. Yeah.
Yeah. We can do that uh, at the end of the year yeah. what, with the learning benchmarks and yeah. you know, internal assessments. We can also do it with MCAS as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try to, we can potentially take a look at, you know, the kids who are in the yellow now and how many moved out. Cause that, that's one of the things when Laura, Laura talks about the, um, the literacy intervention, how we make those decisions for that cohort of kids. That's what we look at is, is how much they've changed. Where are they moving? If they're, even if they're still in the red zone, you know, are they at right. the same, have they moved up in the red zone? Because exactly. at this point, for, for so many of our kids, it's not about the end achievement level, it's about the growth to get there, because that has to be the, the biggest part of it. And I was just going to say that we were, we've been told for years, you know, don't look at the number, look at the growth. Yep. But we don't see that in this type of chart. Right. So sure. that's why the trains look at the growth yep. so we can be happy about what's going yep. on, because usually that's where you see the success. Yep. Um, so I have a couple questions. Sure. So uh, remind me what curriculum, when the last time, like when you're reviewing curriculum, are you ever looking, oh, looking at the program we have? Like, you know, um, elementary is moving to a better product, right? And they had moved to their product when um, Bay State came in as well. Mm -hmm. So they keep evolving and saying, oh, this is not working. Is this is this curriculum or is this practice that it's both 50 50 uh it's hard to know well yet. there isn't there isn't a specific right. program at the middle school so it's scope and sequence and, and curriculum most of it teacher designed and so what we're looking at um in the state of massachusetts has has as part of their website, they have a component that um, that vets different tools and materials and products and really hones in on what um, the state of Massachusetts considers the highest quality. Um, some of it at the middle school is programmatic and some of it is more um, a variety of tools that, that you can um, use to, to execute your curriculum as. So we're looking at all of that. Um, we're also using Ed Reports, which is another um, vetting tool to make sure that we're only looking at the highest quality thing. So we're really going from not having a particular program to coming up or designing something that, that is going to be comprehensive across all the grades. And used cohesively. Yes. And all yeah. that. Um, it's, it's much less common at the middle school level in general to have a program. You know, mm -hmm. like we have big ideas, math. There's, there are fewer of those kinds of things for literacy at the middle school level. That's not to say there aren't any, but most, most middle schools have components that hold. It might be six traits of writing, or it might be um, it, you know, different kinds of comprehension. Um, and so that's that's one of the questions we have about will we end up with a program or will we end up with components that we build a program but either way the cohesiveness and the consistency has to be there right so that depending upon the house you're in it's you're getting the same yes thing um because one of the things that kind of alarms me is that you know k through five we see the growth and we see how kids are exiting fifth mm -hmm. grade right and then we see the performance in sixth grade so i assume mm -hmm. you you know, are there conversations with fifth grade teachers about kind of how kids transition to sixth grade? I mean, have, have we kind of looked at any of the factors that might make a kid who's more successful in fifth grade be less successful in sixth grade? And is that um, part of these data meetings? Um, and, you know, and that, that gets down to the curriculum the practice, the whatever. Are we asking middle school kids to continue reading? I know in the elementary schools, there was always a reading requirement every night. Mm -hmm. um, my son had no reading requirement in middle school, and I, I wish there was, because if there was, he would have read. Um, so I think some of those things that are just habits um, and practice. Right. And the elementary team has been great about allowing me to um, be a part of their review meetings and, and looking at their materials because it's also helping to inform the conversation as far as what are we seeing at the middle school and how how should we uh, create a, a more successful transition and also what are the skills that are needed for a middle school learner and looking at the tools and materials they're using at the elementary schools, how can that reinforce when you're really getting into um, more 
in-depth comprehension and, and a higher level of, of knowledge um, with different areas of content. Thank you. I just want to point out one quick thing before I go on. Sure. Um, they, one of the reasons why we're looking very carefully at the core curriculum at the elementary level, too, is that there's some sense that um, students may probably need to be better prepared with that knowledge and comprehension um, at the elementary schools in order to be able to handle the more rigorous challenges at the at the middle school. So it's not just that O'Malley, the middle school needs to work on uh, what is happening at O'Malley, it's that there's a real recognition that it's all cumulative and that there's work that needs to be done at the elementary as well. Okay, so um, as we talked about, so one of the, the things when we, when we went into sustainable improvement status, we did so be primarily because of our high needs population. So our, our aggregate um, performance was not strong, um, but it was not as, I don't know what the word is I want to use. We were at fifth percentile with our high needs population. So one of the things that we're looking for is how we're growing that population. Now we started with literacy intervention, but a, a, a little differently, but you'll see if, Ben, could you go to the next slide? Yeah. So this is, you look at this, it's not a positive slide, except um, when you look at the turquoise and the orange are the meeting and exceeding, for this is our special education population and economically disadvantaged population combined. That's what's shown here. Um, our, our ELL population was in the middle of WIDA testing when we did the winter. So too many of the kids didn't take the winter star because they were doing their RITA access testing. So I didn't include that in here. Um, star is supposed to be and has been historically a good indicator of performance on state assessments. So MCAS. Um, we right now have 15% uh, of our high needs kids in meeting and exceeding that mid year. So the hope is this projection is that we are not going to be at fifth percentile on MCAS in ELA this year. Um, is it a perfect science? No, we're talking apples to oranges to some extent, it's two different tests. But you know, one of STAR's benefits is that it is a reliable indicator for um, performance on state ass assessments. So um, we're hoping that that is due to growth that we've, you, know, you just saw some of it. And um, when we talk about the literacy intervention, it will come out there too. All right, into math. Um, that picture is not as promising as the ELA. However, I'll preface that by our focus has been on literacy. Next year, our focus is bringing math into the fold as well. So the processes we're putting in place now for curriculum review, um, instructional uh, materials review, practices review, the same way we're doing it for literacy, we'll start up in math next year. Um, so here we are with, again, this, so the sixth grade, if you're looking again at the red, the red, so pretty static, but when you look at the, the blue and green section, sixth grade drops one percentage point, and then we do have growth in seventh and in eighth um, in the meeting and exceeding from fall benchmark to winter benchmark. And you can see it again, the same way, it's the same series of slides where we'll look at, you know, what, unfortunately what we're seeing to some extent in some of the grade levels in math is a little bit of increase and in not meeting. And in sixth grade in particular, there's a little bit of decrease in the meeting meets and exceeding. So that's something that we need to look at, obviously. Um, and, you know, whether it has to do with what's been instructed in the curriculum up to now or not. Um, the teachers are using this information to focus what they're doing the rest of the year. Longitudinally, we're um, a little bit up in the spring, but you can see, I don't know if you remember from the ELA slides, the spring scores were much higher, went down, went back up. Um, this is overall much flatter. What that says about retention, what they really had, how they're progressing through the year, I'm not sure. But this, the, the math data raises a lot of questions that, you know, unfortunately doing everything at once is impossible, but, um, you know, makes us definitely want to dig into the math just as soon as we can to make sure we're asking the same questions and, 
and providing that same support that we're giving to MLA. So seventh grade looks a little different. Um, we do have an increase in meeting and exceeding from fall to winter. Um, still, you know, not meeting is, is about the same of a percentage point, but we've got some growth there from fall to winter overall in seventh grade. Um, and again, the spring, this, I mean, this looks a little more similar to the English in seventh grade, um, where the, the scores were up, they lost some things over the summer or, or maybe not, and then grew in the end. Um, so it's, you know, we're up just a few percentage points from last spring to now. Um, and obviously they've learned this grade level's curriculum, so it's not like we're at the same place with that, um, but there is growth in the end. Um, in eighth grade, is um, a little, you know, fairly similar to seventh. Again, we've got some growth in the end, kids moving from partially meeting into meeting exceeding. And including the spring, you can see how that compares. So again, we've got some growth, not as strong as the English. Um, this is the place where when we look at the statistics for high needs, same group, students with disabilities and economically disadvantaged, um, this is, you know, we've got 5.7% in meeting, no exceeding. So this is where that analysis that you asked about was uh, with partially, that's where the, the teachers turn their focus, but how, how, how many kids are close to meeting that we can hopefully get there by the end of the year. Um, obviously without ignoring the very large percentage that are not meeting at all at this point. So we've got some work to do there. I'm going to turn over to Maura at this point for um, literacy intervention. This is a class that we put in place just this year. Um, would you go to the next slide? Is what I, before we go off math here, I think what's super important is, and as, as the committee knows, you know, we've done, you know, it was really sort of, I think, I think two years of work of the math team on their curriculum review for math and focus. And then this year they're implementing. Um, because the way, for the most part, that, that elementary is structured, a little bit different than Gloucester, which is, which is a good thing. Um, typically in elementary schools, you have the same folks teaching math and English. We platoon some, so it isn't quite that simple, um, but it's very difficult to, um, to sort of stage curriculum review and changes in curriculum programs at the elementary school, because you have the same teachers often teaching all those subjects, right? Whereas the middle school and the high school too, but the middle school specifically, you have the advantage of you can have all of the, you know, those going at the same time, different teachers too, because they're specialized. And that's what, right to start literacy this year, with more coming on. And now also then, as, as you guys described, and also quickly adding, not, not stopping literacy, obviously in ELA, but adding the work, same sort of work on that. As you can see, this is a case where we need that work done. We had hoped to do some math work this year as well. If you remember, we did have an ESSER funded math intervention position in the, the plan, and I could never get anyone hired for it. So mm -hmm. we're going to try again next year because I think that we want to follow the same path. Um, you know, as it turned out, probably better that Laura in her first year here, with the literacy being such a huge part of what we need to do that we didn't take on both at once because we did go back and forth about it a bit at the beginning of the year. But when we didn't have the intervention class coming in and the literacy was such a huge um, uh, task to take on, um, you know, we won't have to wait the three years till we get to full implementation in, in English to, to start the math though, which is good. Something to think about, you brought up that position mm -hmm. that would be extremely helpful. Don't they say, and you would know this, um, in the school world, now is the time to start advertising for those type of positions so yeah. that I've got a couple that I'm going to get up and running. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, we're already advertising for next year's positions. And mm -hmm. I mean, those that we know are you know, open because of retirements or yeah. resignations, you know, no known openings. Uh, folks are advertising and we worked with talk to principal about that two weeks ago. And so they're actively doing that. Okay. And they're very nice to so. Yeah, I'll have a couple postings up short. Thanks, class. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And we talk getting math teachers. <laughs> ben told me I don't have time to both teach math and principal. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's the All right. So um, as I said, the literacy, one of the important things to know about literacy information intervention when we get to the growth and what Laura will talk about the class quite a bit is 
um, our intention was to have a full-time literacy intervention teacher this year and we hired one and then we couldn't find a long-term sub for our el teacher who was on leave so we just started having a full-time literacy intervention teacher january 17th um so the, the person doing that it was doing yale so we now have an el teacher and we have full-time literacy intervention so what's been happening is the teacher's been teaching on odd days um, the literacy intervention and even days doing el so now those even days are going to open up to go into classrooms and do small group work and things like that maybe some additional pull out to supplement the, the growth that's already going on turn over to you on this so our literacy intervention class um, started it in the fall right in the very um, first day of the first semester and as as lynn said it's it's been half time now and now we're, we're growing it and doubling it um, but just during the three terms where we had it um, half time each class was comprised with about 12 to 15 students um, very targeted instruction every student had um, a design instructional plan. We, I'll talk about how we arrived at that, but it was very targeted to what skills we were working on with those um, particular students. There was continu there's continuous progress monitoring to see what the progress is, are the, the interventions we're putting in place for, for each individual child working. If so, obviously we wanna keep doing that. Um, if not, then what do we need to do to, to revamp and change? And also how can we move students through the program and move more more students in. So that's kind of the overarching premise of, of what we want to do. Um, it's 80 minutes three times a week. And, and like I said, that will be doubled uh, with the fourth term. In order to determine how we arrived at who is in the class, it's a whole series of data meetings, um, looking at the STAR 360 data, looking at MCAS data, looking at classroom performance, um, the team meets, looks at all of these things, and then based on um, who would be the best fits for the class, we then do additional um, assessments just to check on fluency, just to check on comprehension. Because when you're talking about ELA is such a huge scope of, of learning, you really need to, to narrow it down to what are, what are the target skills that we need to work on. It's really important that we know if a child is fluent and we need to focus on comprehension or if the, there is a fluency issue underlying, we need to start there. So um, there's all of that work that's going on before a child even steps foot into the um, intervention class. And then there's continuous progress monitoring throughout the term like I said, just to, to make sure that we're on track and to see the growth that we're looking for. Um, and then it's it's continuously revisited for, um, do we want this child to, to maintain in the intervention class for another term or two or three or wh wherever it leads, it's very open-ended, or are, are they ready to uh, move out and move somebody else in? So it's a very cyclical process, but, um, prescriptive at the same time, it's very systematic. Um, and we're just so excited that the teacher is going to be able to, to double that caseload because now we can double the, the amount of students that we can target. Uh, I think the next slide is the most telling slide of, of the whole presentation because what this slide tells us is you have two, in each grade level, you have two data points. You have the top data point being students who were in literacy intervention over the course of this school year, whether it be one term, two terms, three terms, students that got that level of support. And then you have all of the other students. So this is the growth, the percentage of growth that um, students made between the fall and the uh, winter start. The students that received the literacy intervention outperformed every grade level, without question quite significantly and and that's very telling of the impact that this kind of um, approach can have so we just are going to continue to capitalize it on it and, and expand it to math as well i just want to make sure i understand that slide because it's so important so here this is percentage percentage of growth yes so so, so like students who are not in literacy intervention they made 4.2 percent growth mm -hmm. 
right? And the students who were made 6.3%. Yes. Yeah. So this is on a scale of from where they started, to, you know, it's our growth, as you said, Melissa pointed out, it's growth. It's not sort of a... Exactly. It's the average growth that they made over that period of time. And for the all other students, it's students who are at all different levels. Everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. The seventh grade concern. Yeah. It's all concern. Yeah. It's yeah. all concern. Yeah. It's all concern. So one of the things to note with regard to literacy intervention, when we started the class, we made a conscious decision to not include students who have other services. So in other words, students who are receiving academic support, reading tutorial, um, educate, uh, IEPs weren't put into the mix. So we, we started with kids who were in, at the, at, in the at-risk categories, but didn't have other services already because the intent of literacy intervention is a, is a general ed tier two intervention um, and we didn't want to mix it with special ed. Um, what we're finding is, um, to no surprise, Katie and I have talked about this a number of times, that um, we need, we'll need to make some changes in our special education instruction because we should be able to, with the level of support kids get there, we should be making at least as much growth there if not more. Um, so, so one, one these interventions will what's working will inform other parts of the school program, not just the Gen Ed and not just the literacy intervention. You've heard uh, Katie talk about specialized instruction, and you'll hear, hear us talk about that more and more. But that's that's the area we're talking about: specialized instruction in literacy. And you know, uh, so one thing you heard Orton Gillingham or Wilson, that's a sort of training and specific literacy instruction that we can do more of um, at elementary and middle. And, that, and that's essentially their version of intervention. Right? Yes, and just, just to add to that, so I know I, I spoke about the number of students that were found eligible for special education and on individual education programs and that high percentage and how when we put these types of interventions in place, these students make effect, they may have a disability, but if they make effective progress through interventions, they don't need special education services to bring that percentage of students down. Does that make sense? It all comes together. In the end, it all goes back to our tier one curriculum. Right. If we're not aligned, if we don't have high quality materials and practices in place, then everybody ends up in an intervention. And that's, in, in essence, I mean, it's hyperbole to some extent because everyone does it, but we have a lot of kids in special education <coughs> and or underperforming in various other ways. And now later on over the last couple of years, the increase in social emotional needs that impacts a kid's ability to focus, you know, retain information, et cetera. And so, you know, we've got a little perfect storm going here that we're starting to make inroads with and that's exciting to celebrate, but there's not too much celebration we can do yet because we've got a long way to go. So our next steps, uh, obviously we need to complete the literacy review. Um, we wanna get some piloting going for the fall and implementation on a faster track than we might normally do it. Um, we uh, will continue PD for literacy instruction, both for the, the individual teaching the intervention class and for the staff overall. So um, we need to figure out how to, to do, it's a little challenging for me, at least when we have to split the staff to do like we could do keys to literacy with half the staff, we couldn't do it with the whole staff. So, you know, when we plan over the summer for professional development next year, we want to try to figure out how to unify it so that we can keep that consistency going. Because um, it's, you know, where we are when half the staff gets something and the other half doesn't, and, and Maura did a wonderful job bringing, you know, choosing a tool, the two column notes to bring everybody onto the same page, but we want to keep everybody on the same page as much as we can with literacy um, and scaling it. So that's, you know, we already know that um, what we're doing in intervention is working to some extent. How do we get that to be more pervasive? But that obviously we're not gonna have five, 10, 12 kids in an English class. However, can we get those class sizes down a little bit? Can we figure out how to do small group instruction more effectively than we're doing it so that we have um, the, not perception, but you know the structure of small groups, even within a whole class, um, to try to replicate some of that that instruction. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, we're going to start the same process in math because it's you know the kids need 
both of these skill sets in order to succeed in life. Uh, and, and middle school can't be lost years for that reason. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. One thing to add. I thought you were done. I kept on interrupting. I'm sorry. sorry. No, it's me. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, no, what was I going to say? So, uh, two things. Um, one, some Esther dollars are going towards this. So, the interventions we talked about already. I believe the literacy intervention is Esther, but I can't quite remember. I don't know, maybe it's on, on operating budget. I think we brought that into the operating budget. Yeah, yeah sure, sorry, that was a good, good call. So we, we, we had the literacy, we were thinking about the literacy math interventionist on Esther last year. We put the literacy intervention on the operating budget because and both of these ultimately we want an operating budget because they need to okay. stick, okay? Um, the, that was one point. The other point, uh, Sorry, I talked too long. No. Uh, I'll come back to it. Oh, remember, it is also budget related. Um, what isn't on here is that Lynn is working and, and thinking through with a few folks about schedule and staffing in order, you know, can we get smaller class size? What, what can we do? I'm, I sort of signal this to you folks, but we're not, we're not, we haven't quite finalized it yet. But um, uh, what can we do in terms of uh, ESSER and or operating budget? Um, you know, uh, start, you know, starting next year or continuing, I should say, to build on this and making sure that um, Omelia has the resources to do the type of work we're talking about here, which the elementary school has had the resources for. Um, so that's that's still, we'll be, we'll be introducing some stuff in the budget process as we continue. We hope that's the intention. We have, we have to keep doing work though. I just want to say it, it's, it's very, it's a good feeling to hear that well, we see where we're at today, which is where we've kind of been in the past. We haven't fallen behind because of the pandemic, you know, right. and, and that in itself is it's a important. good message. You know, it, it could have, I, I would have expected worse to be honest with you with the experiences the students have had the past couple of years, but to see, I mean, we want better scores, obviously, but at least we're, we're making progress as opposed to trying to catch up. Right, so, so I would agree with that. It, that. That is a celebration point for us. That yeah. you know, we we honestly weren't in a position where we could have afforded loss. So right. it's it's good that you know, that that can be attributed to the work that the staff did exactly over these last few years. So, mm -hmm. is there a common summer program like elementary at middle school? Are there we had one last year. It, it was sporadically attended. I would say. So we're gonna to need to figure out a, we haven't had the conversation finalizing whether we would have one this year, I'm hoping to, um, and then try to figure out how to get families to support and get the kids to come on a regular basis. Um, we do have the funding. Right, yeah, good. So yes, we will have one again, um, but we do, we need kids to come more consistently to it. Because, uh, it's, it's really hard to make any progress if that's not happened. Any other questions or discussion points? Well, thank you for the hard work. I know it's not sure. definitely hard work. Yes. I, actually want, I just have one sort of small question, sure. um, or not so small, on the data meetings. Because yes. um, I feel like I've learned a lot about the data meetings at the elementary level, and I've actually um, heard a little bit about them. Um, are your data meetings, I mean, I, I assume, you know, you have more students. Uh, are your data meetings sort of similar in that you have a team of people who are, you know, going through either a class or a level or something and sort of just sort of thinking through, thinking through sort of creative ways to, to sort of improve their, their, you know, their scores or whatever. I mean, is that, isn't the similar process of the elementary process of the data meeting? I don't know if we do it as frequently mm -hmm. as elementary does. We, our practice has been to do the fall, winter, and spring after the benchmark assessment period. Mm -hmm. uh, more has also added another layer that's happening once per term for literacy to take a look at not only how they did on the fall, winter benchmarks, but also taking a look at class performance and or whatever progress monitoring has happened specific to the literacy intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, are they, have they exited out, which we have had some kids exit out over the year, um, are there new kids that need to come in? Um, and then this, the skills that are being worked on with that. Mm -hmm. It's um, our, our teachers have grade level curriculum meetings um, every cycle. 
those aren't yet really used specifically for a data analysis. They're, they are loosely, especially in math, for example, they give common assessments almost entirely. Um, so they will talk about questions kids were challenged by, you know, whether they were surprised at what kids got or didn't get um, correct on the assessments and, and how the curriculum might need to be adjusted for that. There's um, it's been a lot of adjustment conversations this mm -hmm. year because sure. of you know, what people were able to get to even last year. Sure. Um, despite being in person at center, we had shortened days and people right. had to make choices. So, um, you know, so we're, we're holding our own. Um, but I think that, you know, there is a lot more we could do with data. It's the balance of in a 40 minute meeting, even twice a week, you know, how, how much time do you spend on the data analysis from what's been done? And the logistics of what that needs to come next, right. um, and, sure. and that's that's something that the, the consultants that I mentioned, I'm hoping they come in and spend some uh, some time watching those kinds of things and make some suggestions or give some feedback or have some questions answered by the staff right. um, as to how they're conducting those using that that time. I would just add that it's very it is very similar to the elementary model, except it's a different scale because right. they're not individualized classrooms. Right. But it is it is very closely aligned to to what you would see um, in an elementary model, but just scale different. I only ask because it feels like from the reports that we've gotten that those have been very effective. Mm -hmm. That's just a very effective tool. So obviously, you know, the more we can use it, the better. Yeah. It needs a new name. <laughs> data name doesn't data capture data. what it's really about. It's about student learning, student progress. You have student in there, but but anyway, but it is very good. We have a naming contest. I'm getting updated with that. Actually, yeah. I am. Um, thank you, and thank you more very much for the work thank you're doing, you much. Much. the work doing with your staff, and also helping us understand how it's going. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for the support. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just a few things from me. Hold on. Um, let's get to it. All right. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. Um, as I remind everybody every single time, our primary objective is to safely educate all our students in our schools every day, maximize learning, address our students' full needs, and some support community and family needs. Um, I look forward to the day when safely is more towards the end <laughs> of is, our mission. That is, that is a good, yes. good point. <laughs> the That's a good point. So uh, I was visiting preschool classrooms. I think this was yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. And um, just wonderful, first of all. Um, this is music and movement. Um, and they are uh, listening to music and they're going through different instruments with sort of like going air, air guitar or air keyboard or air drumming. Um, and what was clear to me as I watched it, I have a video, but it doesn't really show very well. What's clear to me is that, for example, when they're playing uh, the guitar part, it was clear that the kids were hearing different types of guitars in their head. <laughs> some were hearing rock, some were hearing heavy metal, some were hearing country, some were hearing classical, but they certainly were enjoying it. It was very, very fun to watch. And, and, and you know, this this is actually, a, it's fun to watch, but also, you know, it's about um, first, you know, releasing energy, which British preschoolers need to do, but it's also about body control, you know, large motor movement, um, controlling your movements, also about, you know, physical space and not running into each other. So those, these are things that preschoolers really have to learn. And this is one of the ways they're learning them actively. So um, it's really, really nice to see. Um, uh, update on the East Gloucester Veterans Naming Process. Uh, the committee, the Nominations Committee is up and running. And so I want to give you an update on that. They had their first meeting today. It was a remote meeting because they have the high school students as well. I'll mention the, I'll highlight who's involved in a moment. Um, today they organized themselves, went over the school committee approved process. So they know what that is. Um, they range over a bunch of things, how nominations um, uh, will be submitted, how to reach out, all, all the you know, outreach they'll have to do, um, locations to submit nominations, 
They started talking about developing an online submission process, which they'll do as well. Um, they have plans to develop a new section of the website where people can go to learn about it and also probably submit nominations. Um, they decided there's a jo joint logo that was created, I'm not sure, probably two years ago, maybe the summer of 2020. Uh, that is the veterans logo, which is a, um, a eagle flying over a lighthouse, which is the East Gloucester logo. And, and they're just gonna be using that sort of temporarily through this process until there's of course a new name. So, um, but it was a very productive meeting. Um, you'll see on the bottom, the staff advisors, uh, both principals, Principal Pascal and Principal Fusco, but then also Carrie Callahan with Flaherty, Don Leone and, and Bethany Gallinelli. Beth Gallinelli are you know, working with the students, okay? And advisors there is really a crucial piece. They're of course, you know, some of these are young kids, they're supporting them, helping them think through things, but they really, um, the students are stepping up to do the work, which is great, and they're excited about it. Um, you see that uh, elementary and ETS vets, those in the first row there, they're students from those schools, but then you also see how they're organized. We have graduates of EGS, of East Gloucester from the high school, a graduate from veterans um, from the high school as well. Still continuing to work on O'Malley, haven't given up there yet. Um, no luck so far, um, but really folks who come, um, and, and they're just a great group of kids. They're very, very excited to, to be participating. Um, next steps, they'll meet twice more this month, and then of course a lot after that as well, but they're, they're, they're moving fast here. Um, the next meeting is gonna be at the building site, so on Webster Street, and they'll be do, doing a video. Uh, uh, to tell, talk about the process and as one of the steps to get people to know what it is. But they'll also be talking about what, what a name of, of the school means to them and, how, and, and the importance of it, the name of their school, future name of the school. Um, they'll begin, to, they'll finalize all the outreach and nomination submissions process. Um, they expect that the public will begin submitting nominations in April. We look forward to that. Yep. And then just to remind folks, the basic concept of the process from there is the nomination nominations committee. So this group I just showed you, now, uh, that's all the nominations that come in from the public. They'll select 10 and they'll get more info, input about those 10 from the public, from alumni, from yourselves. Um, and then they'll narrow that down to three or four, which they then hand off to you and you take it from there and make a final decision. So, yeah. Can you explain that process in between the two you just stated, the 10 to three? Yeah, 10, 10 to three is yeah. So so that'll be some method, and they'll figure this out okay. um, about getting input about those ten from the public. Okay. So rather than getting input from that from say a hundred, right. you okay. narrow it down. Get, and that that could be online. What I one the example I have from my personal experience was actually had forums where people came and heard presentations about the, the names and either you know, the connection or value or there might be history behind them. Who knows? We'll see what the names are. Um, uh, and then people can submit input there about, you know, if we have these public forums, as an example, and, and they can provide input there um, that this you know, nomination committee will collect, but they'll also have online way to collect, that, collect input on those 10 names as well. And can the school committee observe all that? They can observe that. the 10 to 3, not the... Yeah, you can, you can observe. I mean, yeah, you can observe that. When you say observe, you mean like come to the forums? Well, you said the forums. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the public forums. That's how you find the meaning yeah. of the, yeah. the names. If, if, so. if they have, if, I mean, again, yeah. If they have those forums, okay. so it seems like a good idea, right? Yeah. Um, anybody can come, of course. Um, they'll also uh, come to you um, uh, with those ten and have a time where you guys can give input and discuss okay. them as well. Okay, um, specifically, um, but also we, we reach out to alumni, alumni from both school, and, and get their and get um, their input on those ten as well. Yeah. When and is the commit committee meeting? Then? Are they meeting after school or? Yeah, after school at this point. Um, today's meeting after school. Next one will be. Um, uh, they're, they're, I think, open. We discussed, I just was just discussing with the, with the principals in last week. And um, if the high schoolers, for example, need, if, if they need to meet during the day, we'll make sure they can meet during the day. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll talk to the high school. Um, and make sure that those, that, or, or you know, or elementary teachers or stuff, we'll, we'll make sure they can. But and at you're this point, for a couple of O'Malley students, it looks looks like. Yeah, who went to East Gloucester or veterans? Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Thank you. Um, COVID update here. Um, we have uh, at this out right now on social media. For uh, continuing to push the animal rapid test and the vaccinations, we have eight total cases. Got in Manchester. Yeah. 
Uh, you can see that that's fluctuating. I, I, this is a total guess here. I might like so, say anything. I'm not kidding. Forget it. <laughs> okay, predict where we're going to stay, but I'm like that. Okay. Wait, um, so this we're only eight across the district. Eight across the district, right? The yeah, five last week, eight across, no bump from from uh, February vacation. Um, back to decrease. Um, very importantly, so I talk about what what if cases increase. So we've had an example of this this week, okay, where we saw some cases increase. All right, um, on a small level, I mean, we're still you know eight eight students, okay, total. Um, and just as we expected, we did just as we planned. Um, principals worked with with the nurses and the nurse leader. They understood uh, what what that what was happening in that, who was involved. Importantly, then they also talked to identified uh, potential close contacts. Um, they talked to those parents. They found out who which of those students already were involved in our testing protocols. So either pool the COVID at, uh, weekly at school or at home. They offered to get them into those other ones. They also have offered for all of them more at home tests to take home so they can continue to monitor on a regular basis. So not just you know, you know every couple of days. Because um, we want to make sure that uh, there are no new cases, or if they are, we can capture them very quickly. So that was very quick acting, quick acting, and leadership on uh, Jeff Parko's um, uh, part, and then um, obviously kept, kept folks involved, and also pulled families as well. So that's the sort of thing that I I'd anticipate. Like that's the sort of thing that that could happen or can continue to happen, um, and we'll get on it just like that. So we'll that's that. Yeah. Um, I was very surprised this week there was no wastewater testing from last week. Um, and I, um, because we had been told at our meeting from the Board of Health that that was a data point we would have last week. Um, so I don't know if you know. Huh? I don't know. Nope, I, no, not, not that. I reached out to uh, Max Shank about that. Um, yeah. And I actually have an email in, uh, email in my inbox from him. I haven't read it yet. But <coughs> I'll, 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 if there's any, well, I'll find out yeah. why. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if they're gonna. I I don't know if they're planning an ending it or not. It's not a question I asked. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming they're continuing, but I could be wrong. Right. But I'll find out. Okay. Usually yeah. we get the graph and the. No, yeah. and we did. I actually wrote to Max also. Oh, you did. I did, yeah. and he said they didn't do it. They they poo pooed that idea. Wow. I, I know. I had you. I had you. But, uh, but, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, these are our in-school vaccination clinics. They started last week. Sorry, you see the dates here. Another one yesterday, one on Friday at the high school. Um, not extremely well attended so far, honestly, um, but we're continuing to push it and we continue to make sure that our families know when and where uh, vaccination clinics are in the area. And then a couple of questions on weekly attendance. Um, some folks raised, there's, I think, a question that I've been asked, not just by committee members, but um, others, is with going mask optional, does that affect our attendance? So not necessarily see the attendance is pretty flat. This is GHS O'Malley and elementary schools combined. You know, this is a, the week before, the two weeks before February vacation, the week after February vacation. So, so the first week without that's mask optional, pretty flat. I mean, there's no no impact really. Um, that's weekly attendance rates um, for, you know, across the, the elementary school. It's all above ninety. Um, so, but. There are some things that are returning to normal that we wouldn't want them to return yeah. to normal. Oh boy, sure. And that is the sort of, win yeah, there you go, the winter season cold and illness. Um, we are seeing, at least anecdotally, uh, uh, an increase in those. Um, uh, colds, flu, straps, stomach bugs, that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, it is, I think, definitely, and, it, and these are things that didn't have not been in our schools, especially last year, some more this year, but last year, not at all. Um, and uh, so, uh, nurses and teachers looking out for students who may, may be presenting illness. Um, just in one school I was in this this week, uh, nurse was you know checking in with a student because you know just concern for that student and, and that student's health, but also about um, transmitting you know illness as well. Um, you'll see what we saw this week is um, I'll point out a couple examples. Um, this is vets. Um, high dip down. This is the bright green, and then back up again. You know, uh, beaming the same thing. Um, I'm sorry, Plum Cove was an example on the the brown here. Being you know beginning of this week, uh, dip down, and then as 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 the week progressed, up again. So, so I think we're going to see those sorts of again. We're all we're not talking. This is 85 percent and above still, but 
that type of thing as we go through the winter. Um, you know, dips, individual schools, and uh, an illness that could be in a, in a classroom or a grade. I'm not talking about other than the COVID. Um, I, and I will say this, that we will continue to urge families to keep students home if they feel any illness symptoms. That's beyond COVID. Okay, that's good practice. We know that better than ever, ever now. And mask wearing beyond COVID, I've talked about this, but we'll continue to tell folks that it's okay to, to wear a mask, like the folks do in many other cultures, to protect yourself or protect others. I mean, you may be getting over a cold, and it's okay to wear to choose to wear a mask in that in that situation, um, to think about others in that, in that way. Or um, if you don't want to get a cold, or you because you're concerned about this time this time of the year, and I mean beyond COVID, that's okay. That needs to be you know, an okay situation for folks to make that choice in our schools, um, in our classrooms, or even outside. Um, so. so are you saying if someone has a mild something, sore throat, wears a mask, we're okay with that? I will, I will message that it's okay for them to make that choice. Yeah. You know, rather than having stigma on it. Um, which no, is, not the mask oh, sorry. wearing. No, oh, sorry. But to come to school. I mean, there's many times you may not be feeling perfect, but you can still function in a job, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, given some of the academic um, goals we have, yeah, yeah, and, right. and kids don't want to miss school and material, right? Yeah. Because it's very, you know, probably a lot of missed school for various reasons. Um, this is a, this so is, that's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. not a question to answer now. Yeah, I realize yeah. we're still trying to say, let's just try to keep everybody healthy. But I think at some point we all, used to go into work with a little sniffles. bit of a sore throat or sniffles and you try to stay away from people or as you say wear a mask right yeah 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 don't. There, there, there's, there's, it's all judgment calls right yeah. and i think it's level of severity in some, some ways yeah. i mean because um, because you're, you're, you're balancing these things right okay. as you said um so i don't think it's a you know we will send you home if you're sniffling right. type of thing um, but I think it's being sensible of well, protecting yourself and others, you know, thinking of yourself and others and your family. Um, but again, it's, 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 it's balancing act. It's a really important balancing act. Okay. Um, and that's all. That's it. Really? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's contagious. Okay. Um, Anybody want to move to accept the superintendent's report? <laughs> Second. Okay. Maria, can we vote, please? Laura? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Greg? Yes. Um, accept the superintendent's report. Um, there are no sub subcommittee reports. Um, no subcommittee meetings happened since last meeting. We have two grants to accept under action. Um, one, the first one is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, fiscal year 2022, social emotional learning and mental health grant in the amount of 98,970. 97,000. 97,970, okay. So move to accept, second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Um, roll, roll call vote, Brian, please. Laura? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Greg? Yes. Okay. And the second grant is from the Gloucester Education Foundation in the amount of $5,300 for the Gloucester High School DECA State Tournament. So no acceptance. Second. Discussion? No? Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Laura? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Greg? Yes. Accept these grants. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next is discussion or other communications. Um, East Gloucester Veterans School Building Committee update. We haven't really met. There's a meeting tomorrow at 5. Um, there are uh, two things there will be topping off ceremony on I think April 8th, of course, get that to you, um, which is the topping off ceremony. It's, it's essentially the last steel beam that's placed in the building. It's very sort of typical, traditional, old timey ceremony. Um, and we're going to have the, no. the staff from both schools. No. Okay. Staff from both schools. So you, you paint the last beam white, 
Okay, so that allows the staff of both schools to sign it. Oh, wow. And then we'll have, that, they'll do that uh, about a week or two before, come over on a, on a Tuesday, afternoon, Tuesday afternoon during like the staff meeting time. And um, then the day of the topic of ceremony, a lot of the second graders from both schools come and sign their names on the beam before it's hoisted up into place. Um, it's exciting, I think it's April 8th. And then, um, another thing here. Oh, I know. April uh, 23rd, I believe, there are project teams. So our own, uh, owner's project manager, construction manager, and designer uh, representatives from those three, three companies will come give a full update on the progress and the future steps. Much more involved than just the, the, you know, the basic updates we provide you guys. On the 23rd? Thirteen. That's a. Any date I say cannot be. Uh, can't, can't be held right now. So Thursday. they come into this meeting. Yeah, really, okay. yeah, really, yeah. Okay. They're on our agenda. Okay. Um, let's show some nice pictures. That's some exciting things. So one of the things that's happening at the meeting tomorrow, um, it's pretty much standard business tomorrow because we're moving along. Things become more predictable. Um, but one of the things that um, we recently saw were really detailed reports that the project team puts together for the MSBA and for their tracking. Um, and so Ben has been kind of pushing to have like um, kind of snapshots so we can put on the project website of kind of what's happening now, what's happening in the next week or two. So that's one piece. And then through that came these, oh, we put these things together regularly for the MSBA. So we thought it'd be very good for the project team and the public to realize the extensive detail that they document and report, um, photograph, I mean, all sorts of things that I guess you assume there's some level, but it's really impressive when you see um, some, you know, the detail of which they they track everything. How are they doing with change orders? We haven't, haven't had any yet. That's huge. Uh, no, right. You know, it was all. It was all because they just really finished the, yeah. no, the, the bidding, the contracting, and and the and the and the. Um, it was just a. So we haven't gotten the change orders stage yet. Yeah. This is the primary reason I'm in the Well, there could have been what's going on now, right? Well, the steel was all the early package, so so the steel was bid a long time ago, a while ago, and then since then they've been finalizing. And then did about a month ago all the bidding and, and, and the final contracts on, on um, recommendations for all the other subs. So that because that work hasn't begun yet, there hasn't really been any need for me or the that stuff yet. But there's been no problems doing what they're doing. So no problem. Good. No, no yeah, yeah. On, on budget, <laughs> yeah. on schedule. Yeah, right. And they were awarded based upon the value engineering and yeah. that change in scope already. Yeah. yeah. So there was through value engineering, there were some change in scope, not impacting education. More on sort of finishes and 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 mm -hmm. and um, more on finishes and then also some exterior stuff. Yeah. So drive by regularly. It's you know. Yeah, it's yeah that was fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully tomorrow we'll have a time lapse or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Anybody have any old new business? This is it, new business, but I just wanted to make sure everyone knows our um, program subcommittee meeting that was supposed to be tomorrow is now on March 17th. And that's when Attendance Works is gonna be coming again to give us some of their policy recommendations. I so, hope none of you are Irish. I understand. Uh, maybe one of us. I understand. Curious. I understand. Um, but that's when they could do it. There were some new DESE regulations that they needed to incorporate. So okay. just, I know everybody's interested in that. Um, I have one item which is um, we, um, I assume some of us got the communication from MASC on suggested changes to non-discrimination mm -hmm. policies. So I have asked, um, I just got the email and I said, do you have a red line version? So we understand what they are coming mm -hmm. forward with. And one of them seems to be a red line version. Um, the other one just seems a formatting red line mm -hmm. version. So um, I, think it's a, I think it's worth referring out to programs to Kind of compare and contrast, um, sure. As they updated this for um, 
There's certain language. Can you send me the red line version? I don't, I don't yeah, I'll happily send you. Thank you. What I have. Um, probably won't be able to do it this year. So that's policies, Maria. Um, file AC, AC-R, um, JICK, and ACAV. AC. Right. And I, as I say, they're not all red lines, so I'm not quite sure where the changes are. But um, if there are no changes to what they sent out in some of these, then. Okay, I'll take a look. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, sorry, the meeting was as long as it was. That was not really the intent. And, <laughs> but um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Can we have a roll call vote? Laura? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Phil? Yes. Keith? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Greg? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, attendees, for staying with us. And, uh, have a good night. Good night. Good night, Greg. Good night, Greg. Good night, Greg. Good night, Greg. Um,